introduction to tea drinking in eighteenth century america its etiquette and equipage this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org recording by david wales tea drinking in eighteenth century america its etiquette and equipage by rodris roth introduction in eighteenth-century america the pleasant practice of taking tea at home was an established social custom with a recognized code of manners and distinctive furnishings pride was taken in a correct and fashionable tea-table whose equipage included much more than teapot cups and saucers it was usually the duty of the mistress to make and pour the tea and it was the duty of the guests to be adept at handling a teacup and saucer and to provide social chit-chat because of the expense and time involved the tea-party was limited to the upper classes consequently such an affair was a status symbol the cocktail party of the twentieth century has perhaps replaced the tea party of the eighteenth century as a social custom reflecting the contrast between the relaxed atmosphere of yesterday with the hurried pace of to-day the author miss roth is assistant curator of cultural history in the united states national museum smithsonian institution End of introduction. Part One of Tea Drinking in Eighteenth Century America by Rodris Roth. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. The Americans use much tea, noted the Abbe Robin during his visit to this country in 1781. The greatest mark of civility and welcome they can show you is to invite you to drink it with them. Tea was the social beverage of the eighteenth century serving it was a sign of politeness and hospitality and drinking it was a custom with distinctive manners and specific equipment most discussions of the commodity have dealt only with its political historical or economic importance however in order to understand the place tea holds in this country's past it also is important to consider the beverage in terms of the social life and traditions of the americans as the abbe robin pointed out not only was tea an important commodity on this side of the atlantic but the imbibing of it was an established social practice an examination of tea-time behavior and a consideration of what utensils were used or thought appropriate for tea-drinking are of help in reconstructing and interpreting american history as well as in furnishing and recreating interiors of the period thus bringing into clearer focus the picture of daily life in eighteenth-century america for these reasons and because the subject has received little attention the present study has been undertaken tea had long been known and used in the orient before it was introduced into europe in the early part of the seventeenth century at about the same time two other new beverages appeared chocolate from the americas and coffee from the near east the presence of these commodities in european markets is indicative of the vigorous exploration and active trade of that century which also witnessed the successful settlement of colonies in north america by about mid-seventeenth century the new beverage was being drunk in england and by the sixteen nineties were being sold in new england at first chocolate was preferred but coffee being somewhat cheaper soon replaced it and in england gave rise to a number of public places of refreshment known as coffee houses coffee was of course the primary drink of these establishments but that tea also was available is indicated by an advertisement that appeared in an english newspaper in sixteen fifty eight one of the earliest advertisements for tea it announced that excellent and by all physicians approved china drink called by the chineans cha by other nations te alias tea is sold at the sultana's head a coffee-house in sweetings rents by the royal exchange london for a time tea was esteemed mainly for its curative powers which explains why it was by all physicians approved according to an english broadside published in sixteen sixty the numerous contemporary ailments which tea helpeth included the headaches giddiness and heaviness 
it was also considered good for colds dropsies and scurvies and it expelleth infection it prevents and cures agues surfeits and fevers by the end of the seventeenth century however tea's medicinal qualities had become secondary to its fashionableness as a unique drink tea along with the other exotic and novel imports from the orient such as fragile porcelains lustrous silks and painted wallpapers had captured the european imaginations though the beverage was served in public pleasure gardens as well as coffee houses during the early seventeen hundreds in england social tea drinking in the home was gradually coming into favour the coffee-houses continued as centres of political social and literary influence as well as of commercial life into the first half of the nineteenth century for apparently englishmen preferred to drink their coffee in public rather than private houses and among male rather than mixed company this was in contrast to tea which was drunk in the home with breakfast or as a morning beverage and socially at afternoon gatherings of both sexes as we see in the painting an english family at tea as tea drinking in the home became fashionable both host and hostess took pride in a well-appointed tea table for a teapot of silver or fragile blue and white oriental porcelain with matching cups and saucers and other equipage added prestige as well as elegance to the tea-time ritual at first the scarcity and expense of the tea the costly paraphernalia used to serve it and the leisure considered necessary to consume it limited the use of this commodity to the upper classes for these reasons social tea drinking was understandably a prestige custom one becomes increasingly aware of this when looking at english paintings and prints of the early eighteenth century such as family group painted by gowan hamilton about seventeen thirty family members are portrayed in the familiar setting of their own parlor with its panelled walls and comfortable furnishings their pet a small dog surveys the scene from a resting place on a corner of the carpet tea time appears to have just begun for cups are still being passed around and others on the table await filling from the nearby porcelain teapot it seems reasonable to assume since the painting is portraiture that the family is engaged in an activity which although familiar is considered suitable to the group's social position and worthy of being recorded in oil that tea drinking was a status symbol also is indicated by the fact that the artist has used the tea ceremony as the theme of the picture and the tea table as the focal point eighteenth-century pictures and writings are basic source materials for information about anglo-american tea drinking see the chronological list of pictures consulted on page ninety a number of the pictures are small-scale group or conversation piece paintings of english origin in which family and friends are assembled at tea similar to family group and they provide pictorial information on tea-time modes and manners the surroundings in which the partakers of tea are depicted also reveal information about the period and about the gracious living enjoyed in the better homes panelled walls and comfortable chairs handsome chests and decorative curtains objects of ceramic and silver and glass all were set down on canvas or paper with painstaking care and sometimes with a certain amount of artistic license a careful study of these paintings provides an excellent guide for furnishing and reconstructing period rooms and exhibits even to the small details such as objects on mantels tables and chests thus further documenting data from newspapers journals publications and writings of the same period in america as in england tea had a rather limited use as a social beverage during the early seventeen hundreds judge samuel sewell the recorder extraordinary of boston life at the turn of the seventeenth century seems to have mentioned tea only once in his copious diary in the entry for april fifteenth seventeen o nine sewell wrote that he had attended a meeting at the residence of madame winthrop where the guests drunk ale tea wine at this time ale and wine in contrast to tea were fairly common drinks 
since tea and the equipment used to serve it were costly social tea drinking was restricted to the prosperous and governing classes who could afford the luxury the portrayal of the rotund silver teapot and other tea drinking equipment in such an american painting as susanna truax done by an unknown painter in 1730 indicates that in this country as in england not only was the tea ceremony of social importance but also that a certain amount of prestige was associated with the equipage and the very fact that an artist was commissioned for a portrait of this young girl is suggestive of a more than ordinary social status of the sitter and activity depicted english customs were generally imitated in this country particularly in the urban centres of boston where he visited in seventeen forty joseph bennett observed that the ladies here visit drink a tea and indulge every little piece of gentility to the height of the mode and neglect the affairs of their families with as good grace as the finest ladies in london english modes and manners remained a part of the social behavior after the colonies became an independent nation visitors to the newly formed united states were apt to remark about such habits as tea-drinking as did brissot de varvel in seventeen eighty eight that in this as in their whole manner of living the americans in general resemble the english therefore it is not surprising to find that during the eighteenth century the serving of tea privately in the morning and socially in the afternoon or early evening was an established custom in many households the naturalist peter calm during his visit to north america in the mid eighteenth century noted that tea was a breakfast beverage in both pennsylvania and new york from the predominantly dutch town of albany in seventeen forty nine he wrote that their breakfast is tea commonly without milk at another time calm stated with the tea was eaten bread and butter or buttered bread toasted over the coals so that the butter penetrated the whole slice of bread in the afternoon about three o'clock tea was drunk again in the same fashion except that bread and butter was not served with it this tea-drinking schedule was followed throughout the colonies in boston the people take a great deal of tea in the morning have dinner at two o'clock and about five o'clock they take more tea some wine madeira and punch reported the baron cromot du bourg during his visit in seventeen eighty one the marquis de castellux confirms his countryman's statement about tea-time mentioning that the americans take a tea and punch in the afternoon during the first half of the eighteenth century the limited amount of tea available at prohibitively high prices restricted its use to a proportionately small segment of the total population of the colonies about mid-century however tea was beginning to be drunk by more and more people as supplies increased and costs decreased due in part to the propaganda and merchandising efforts of the east india company according to peter calm tea chocolate and coffee had been wholly unknown to the swedish population of pennsylvania and the surrounding area before the english arrived but in seventeen forty eight these beverages at present constitute even the country people's daily breakfast a similar observation was made a few years later by israel acrilius tea coffee and chocolate are so general as to be found in the most remote cabins if not for daily use yet for visitors mixed with muscovado or raw sugar america was becoming a country of tea drinkers then in seventeen sixty seven the townsend act imposed a duty on tea among other imported commodities merchants and citizens in opposition to the act urged a boycott of the taxed articles a virginia woman in a letter to friends in england wrote in seventeen sixty nine i have given up the article of tea but some are not quite so tractable however if we can convince the good folks on your side the water of their error we may hope to see happier times in spite of the tax many colonists continued to indulge in tea drinking by seventeen seventy three the general public according to one philadelphia merchant can afford to come at this piece of luxury while one-third of the population at a moderate computation drink tea twice a day 
It was at this time, however, that efforts were made to enforce the English tea tax, and the result was that most famous of tea parties, the Boston Tea Party. Thereafter, an increasing number of colonists abstained from tea drinking as a patriotic gesture. Philip Fithian, a tutor at Nomini Hall, the Virginia plantation of Colonel Robert Carter, wrote in his journal on Sunday, May 29, 1774, after dinner we had a grand and agreeable walk in and through the gardens there is great plenty of strawberries some cherries gooseberries and so forth drank coffee at four they are now too patriotic to use tea and indeed they were patriotic for by september the taste of tea almost had been forgotten at nomini hall as fithian vividly recounted in his journal something in our palace this evening very merry happened mrs carter made a dish of tea at coffee she sent me a dish and the colonel both ignorant he smelt sipped looked at last with great gravity he asked what's this do you ask sir Puh! and out he throws it splash a sacrifice to vulcan other colonists in their own way also showed their distaste for tea Shortly before the outbreak of the American Revolution, there appeared in several newspapers an expression of renouncement in rhyme. A lady's adieu to her tea-table, below, which provides a picture of contemporary tea-time etiquette and equipage. A lady's adieu to her tea-table. Farewell the tea-board with your gaudy attire, ye cups and ye saucers that I did admire. To my cream-pot and tongs I now bid adieu, that pleasures all fled that I once found in you. Farewell pretty chess that so lately did shine, with hissen and congo and best double fine. Many a sweet moment by you I have sat, hearing girls and old maids to tattle and chat and the spruce coxcomb laugh at nothing at all only some silly work that might happen to fall no more shall my teapot so generous be in filling the cups with this pernicious tea for i'll fill it with water and drink out the same before i'll lose liberty that dearest name because i am taught and believe it is fact that our ruin is aimed at in the late act of imposing a duty on all foreign teas which detestable stuff we can quit when we please liberty's the goddess that i do adore and i'll maintain her right until my last hour before she shall part i will die in the cause for i'll never be governed by tyranny's laws many people gave up tea for the duration of the war and offered various substitute beverages such as coffee and dried raspberry leaves a detestable drink which the americans had the heroism to find good remarked a post-war visitor leon chateau although the colonists had banished tea with enthusiasm the tea habit was not forgotten chateau further noted that they all drink tea in america as they drink wine in the south of france tea drinking continued to be an important social custom in the new nation well into the nineteenth century the tea ceremony sometimes simple sometimes elaborate was the very core of family life moreau de saint marie observed in seventeen ninety five during his residence in philadelphia that the whole family is united at tea to which friends acquaintances and even strangers are invited that tea-time hospitality was offered to the newest of acquaintances or even strangers is verified by claude blanchard he wrote of his visit to newport rhode island on july twelfth seventeen eighty that in the evening there was an illumination i entered the house of an inhabitant who received me very well i took tea there which was served by a young lady and while staying in boston blanchard mentioned that a new acquaintance invited us to come in the evening to take tea at his house we went there the tea was served by his daughter in the daily routine of activities when the hour for tea arrived moreau de saint marie remarked that the mistress of the house serves it and passes it around in the words of another late eighteenth-century diarist the marquis de barbet morbois 
those present might seat themselves at a spotless mahogany table and the eldest daughter of the household or one of the youngest married women makes the tea and gives a cup to each person in the company family group provides an illustration of this practice in the early part of the century during the tea hour social and economic affairs were discussed gossip exchanged and according to barbet marbois when there is no news at all they repeat old stories many entries in nancy shippen's journal between seventeen eighty three and seventeen eighty six indicate that this philadelphian passed many such hours in a similar manner on march eleventh seventeen eighty five she wrote about four in the afternoon dr cutting came in and we spent the afternoon in the most agreeable chit-chat manner drank a very good dish of tea together and then separated part of an undated entry in december seventeen eighty three reads this afternoon we were honored with the company of general washington to tea mrs and major moore mrs stewart mr powell mr b washington and two or three more if acquaintances of nancy's own age were present or the company large the tea hour often extended well into the evening with singing conversing dancing and playing of whist chess or cards of one such occasion she wrote mrs allen and miss jews drank tea with me and spent the evening there was half a dozen agreeable and sensible men that was of the party the conversation was carried on in the most sprightly agreeable manner the ladies bearing by far the greatest part till nine when cards was proposed and about ten refreshments were introduced which concluded the evening obviously young men and women enjoyed the sociability of tea-time for it provided an ideal occasion to get acquainted when the marquis de chastelux was in philadelphia during the seventeen eighties he went one afternoon to take tea with madame shippen and found a musical entertainment to meet with his approval and a relationship between the sexes which had parental sanction one young miss played on the clavichord and miss shippen sang with timidity but a very pretty voice accompanied for a time by monsieur otto on the harp dancing followed noted the marquis while well, mothers and other grave personages conversed in another room in new york as in philadelphia tea-time was an important part of the younger set's social schedule eliza bone writing to her sister in january eighteen ten reported that as to news new york is not so gay as last winter few balls but a great many tea-parties the feminine interest and participation in such gatherings of personable young men and attractive young women was expressed by nancy shippen when she wrote in her journal after such a party saturday night at eleven o'clock i had a very large company at tea this evening the company is but just broke up i don't know when i spent a more merry evening we had music cards and so forth a masculine view of american tea parties was openly voiced by one foreign visitor prince de brulee who upon arrival in america in seventeen eighty two only knew a few words of english but knew better how to drink excellent tea with even better cream how to tell a lady she was pretty and a gentleman he was sensible by reason whereof i possessed all the elements of social success similar feelings were expressed by the comte de ségur during his sojourn in america in the late eighteenth century when in a letter to his wife in france he wrote my health continues excellent despite the quantity of tea one must drink with the ladies out of gallantry and of madeira all day long with the men out of politeness festive tea parties such as the ones described above are the subject of some of the group portraits or conversation pieces painted about seventeen thirty by the english artist william hogarth the assembly at bonstead house now in the philadelphia museum of art illustrates quite an elegant affair taking place in a large richly decorated english interior the artist has filled the canvas with people standing and conversing while a seated group plays cards at a table in the center of the room to one side near the fireplace a man and two women drinking tea are seated at an ornately carved square tea-table with a matching stand for the hot-water kettle 
on a dish or circular stand in the centre of the table is a squat teapot with matching cups and saucers arranged in parallel rows on either side tea-drinking guests seem to have been free to sit or stand according to their own pleasure or the number of chairs available and barbet marbois noted that at american tea-parties uh, people change seats some go others come the written and visual materials offer little in the way of evidence to suggest that in general men stood and women sat during tea-time in fact places at the tea-table were taken by both sexes even at formal tea-parties such as the one depicted in the assembly at bonstead house a less formal but more usual tea scene is the subject of another hogarth painting the wollaston family now in the leicester art gallery england the afternoon gathering has divided into two groups one playing cards the other drinking tea an atmosphere of ease and comfort surrounds the party the men and women seated at the card table are discussing the hand just played while the women seated about the square tea table in front of the fireplace are engaged in conversation a man listens as he stands and stirs his tea each drinker holds a saucer with a cup filled from the teapot on a square tile or stand in the centre of the table one woman is returning her cup turned upside down on the saucer to the table more about this particular habit later end of part one part two of tea drinking in eighteenth century america by rodris roth this librivox recording is in the public domain the same pleasant social atmosphere seen in english paintings seems to have surrounded tea-time in america as the previously cited entries in nancy shippen's journal book suggest her entry for january eighteenth seventeen eighty four supplies a description that almost matches the wollaston family a stormy day alone till the afternoon and then was honoured with the company of mr jones a gentleman lately from europe mr du Ponceur, and mr hollingsworth at tea we conversed on a variety of subjects and played at whist upon the whole spent an agreeable evening tea was not only a beverage of courtship it also was associated with marriage both peter calm in seventeen fifty and moreau de saint Marie in the seventeen nineties report the philadelphia custom of expressing good wishes to a newly married couple by paying them a personal visit soon after the marriage it was the duty of the bride to serve wine and punch to the callers before noon and tea and wine in the afternoon no doubt make-believe tea-time and pretend tea-drinking were a part of some children's playtime activities perhaps many a little girl played at serving tea and dreamed of having a tea-party of her own but few were as fortunate as young peggy livingston who at about the age of five was allowed to invite by cod twenty young misses to her own tea-party and ball she uh, treated them with all good things and a violin wrote her grandfather there were five coaches at the door and ten when they departed i was much amused two hours tea seems to have been the excuse for many a social gathering large or small formal or informal and sometimes an invitation to drink tea meant a rather elegant party that is to say wrote one cosmopolitan observer of the american scene in the seventeen eighties the marquis de chasteleur to attend a sort of assembly pretty much like the conversazione social gathering of italy for tea here is the substitute for the renfesco refreshment a view of such an event has been depicted in the english print conversazione published in seventeen eighty two it is hoped that the stiffly seated and solemn-faced guests became more talkative when the tea arrived however this tea-party may have been like the ones ferdinand bayard attended in bath virginia of which he wrote the only thing you hear while they are taking tea is the whistling sound made by the lips on edges of the cups this music is varied by the request made to you to have another cup 
At tea parties, cakes, cold pastries, sweetmeats, preserved fruits, and plates of cracked nuts might also be served, according to Mrs. Anne Grant's reminiscences of pre-revolutionary America. Peter Kalm noted during his New York sojourn in 1749 that when you paid a visit to any home, a bowl of cracked nuts and one of apples were set before you, which you ate after drinking tea and even at times whilst partaking of tea. Sometimes wine and punch were served at tea time, and in summer, observed Barbe Marbois, they add fruit and other things to drink. Coffee, too, might be served, as the Frenchman Claude Blanchard explained. They, the Americans, do not take coffee immediately after dinner, but it is served three or four hours afterwards with tea. This coffee is weak, and four or five cups are not equal to one of ours, so that they take many of them. The tea, on the contrary, is very strong. This use of tea and coffee is universal in America. Dealing with both food and drink at the same time was something of an art. It was also an inconvenience for the uninitiated, and on one occasion Ferdinand Bayard, a late eighteenth-century observer of American tea ritual, witnessed another guest who, after having taken a cup of tea in one hand and tartlets in the other, opened his mouth and told the servant to fill it for him with smoked venison. While foreign visitors recognized that the greatest mark of courtesy a host and hostess could offer a guest was a cup of tea, hospitality could be hot water torture for foreigners unless they understood the social niceties not only of holding a cup and tartlet but of declining without offending by turning the cup upside down and placing a spoon upon it the ceremony of the teaspoon is fully explained by the prince de broly who during his visit to philadelphia in seventeen eighty two reported the following tea-time incident at the home of robert morris i partook of most excellent tea and i should be even now still drinking it i believe if the french ambassador had not charitably notified me at the twelfth cup that i must put my spoon across it when i wished to finish with this sort of warm water he said to me, It is almost as ill-bred to refuse a cup of tea when it is offered to you, as it would be indiscreet for the mistress of the house to propose a fresh one, when the ceremony of the spoon has notified her that we no longer wish to partake of it. Bayard reports that one quick-witted foreigner, uninformed as to the teaspoon signal, had had his cup filled again and again, until he finally decided after emptying it to put it into his pocket until the replenishments had been concluded. The gracious art of brewing and serving tea was as much an instrument of sociability as was a bit of music or conversation this custom received the attention of a number of artists and it is amazing what careful and detailed treatment they gave to the accessories of tea we are familiar with the journals newspaper advertisements and other writings that provide contemporary reports on this custom but it is to the artist we turn for a more clearly defined view the painter saw, arranged, and gave us a visual image, sometimes richly informative, as in Tea Party in the time of George I, of the different tea-time items and how they were used. The unknown artist of this painting, done about 1725, has carefully illustrated each piece of equipment considered appropriate for the tea ceremony and used for brewing the tea in the cups held with such grace by the gentleman and child. Throughout the 18th century the well-equipped tea-table would have displayed most of the items seen in this painting, a teapot, slop-bowl, container for milk or cream, tea-canister, sugar-container, tongs, teaspoons, and cups and saucers. These pieces were basic to the tea ceremony, and with the addition of a tea urn, which came into use during the latter part of the 18th century, have remained the established tea equipage up to the present day. Even a brief investigation of about twenty inventories, itemized lists of the goods and property of deceased persons that were required by law, reveal that in New York between 1742 and 1768, teapots, cups and saucers, teaspoons, and tea canisters were owned by both low- and high-income groups in both urban and rural areas. 
the design and ornament of the tea vessels and utensils of course differed according to the fashion of the time and the various items associated with the beverage provide a good index of the stylistic change in the eighteenth century the simple designs and unadorned surfaces of the plump pear-shaped teapot in tea party in the time of george the first and the spherical one seen in the portrait susanna truax mark these pieces as examples of the late baroque style popular in the early part of the eighteenth century about mid-century teapots of inverted pear shape associated with the rococo style began to appear a pot of this shape is depicted in the portrait paul revere painted about seventeen sixty five by john singleton copley and owned by the museum of fine arts boston the fact that a teapot was chosen as an example of revere's craft from all of the objects he made indicates that such a vessel was valued as highly by its maker as by its owner the teapot was a mark of prestige for both craftsman and hostess apparently the famous silversmith and patriot was still working on the piece for the nearby tools suggest that the teapot was to have engraved and chaste decoration perhaps of flowers scrolls and other motifs typical of the rococo style the restrained decoration and linear outlines of the teapot illustrated in the print titled the old maid and the straight sides and oval shape of the teapot belonging to a late eighteenth century child set of chinese export porcelain are characteristics of the neoclassic style that was fashionable at the end of the century tea drinkers were extremely conscious of fashion changes and whenever possible set their tea tables with stylish equipment in the prevailing fashion newspaper advertisements journals letters and other written materials indicate that utensils in the best and newest taste were available desired purchased and used in this country further verification of the types and kinds of equipage used is supplied by archaeological investigations of colonial sites for instance shards or fragments of objects dug from or near the site of a dwelling at marlborough virginia owned and occupied by john mercer between seventeen twenty six and seventeen sixty eight included a silver teaspoon made about seventeen thirty five and two teapot tops one a pewter lid and the other a staffordshire salt glaze cover made about seventeen forty five as well as numerous pieces of blue and white oriental porcelain cups and saucers such archaeological data provides concrete proof about tea furnishings used in this country a comparison of shards from colonial sites with wares used by the english and of english origin indicates that similar types of equipage were to be found upon tea tables in both countries this also substantiates the already cited american practice of following english modes and manners a practice brissot de Vaville noted in seventeen eighty eight when he wrote that in this country tea forms as in england the basis of the principal parties of pleasure tea furnishings when in use were to be seen upon rectangular tables with four legs square top and circular top tripods and pembroke tables such tables were of course used for other purposes but a sampling of eighteenth-century boston inventories reveals that in some households all or part of the tea paraphernalia was prominently displayed on the tea-table rather than being stored in cupboards or closets a japanned tea-table and china and a mahogany do and china both in the great room are listed in mrs hannah pemberton's inventory recorded in boston in seventeen fifty eight the inventory of joseph blake of boston recorded in seventeen forty six lists a tea-table with a set of china furniture in the back room of the house while in the closet in the front room were six teacups and saucers along with other ceramic wares the most popular type of tea table apparently was the circular tripod that is a circular top supported on a pillar with three feet this kind of table is seen again and again in the prints and paintings and is listed in the inventories of the period these tables usually of walnut or mahogany had stationary or tilt tops with plain scalloped or carved edges 
square or round tripod or four-legged the tables were usually placed against the wall of the room until tea-time when in the words of ferdinand bayard a mahogany table is brought forward and placed in front of the lady who pours the tea this practice is depicted in a number of eighteenth-century pictures with the tea-table well out in the room often in front of a fireplace and with seated and standing figures at or near the table evidence of such furniture placement in american parlors is recorded in a sketch and note nancy shippen received from one of her beaux who wrote in part this evening i passed your house and seeing company in the parlor i peeped through the window and saw a considerable tea company of which by their situation i could only distinguish four persons you will see the plan of this company upon the next page in the sketch a floor plan of the shippen parlor we can see the sofa against the wall between the windows while chairs and tea-table have been moved out in the room the table is near the fireplace where miss shippen served the tea in the eighteenth century such an arrangement was first and foremost one of comfort and perhaps also of taste the diary of jacob hiltzheimer indicates that in seventeen eighty six the first signs of fall were felt on august first for the philadelphian wrote this evening it was so cool that we drank tea by the fire in the south as in the north tea or at the time of the american revolution its patriotic substitute coffee was served by the fire as soon as the first winter winds were felt philip fithian while at nomini hall in virginia wrote in his journal on september nineteenth seventeen seventy four the air is clear cold and healthful we drank our coffee at the great house very sociably around a fine fire the house and air feels like winter again tablecloths usually square white ones that showed folds from having been stored in a linen press were used when tea was served but it is difficult to say with any certainty if their use depended upon the whim of the hostess the type of the table or the time of day a cloth probably was used more often on a table with a plain top than on one with scalloped or carved edges however as can be seen in family group and an english family at tea it was perfectly acceptable to serve tea on a plain top table without a cloth apparently such tables were also used at breakfast or morning tea because benjamin franklin in a letter from london dated february nineteenth seventeen fifty eight gave the following directions for the use of six course diaper breakfast cloths which he sent to his wife they are to spread on the tea-table for nobody breakfasts here on the naked table but on the cloth set a large tea-board with the cups some of the eighteenth-century paintings depicting tea-tables with cloths do deal with the morning hours as indicated by their titles or internal evidence as in the honeymoon painted by john collett about seventeen sixty in this scene of domestic confusion and bliss a tray or tea-board has been placed on the cloth illustrating franklin's comment about english breakfast habits cloths may be seen in pictures in which the time of day cannot be determined therefore the use of a cloth at tea-time may in truth have depended upon the hostess's whim if not her pocket-book in addition trays or tea-boards of various sizes and shapes were sometimes used they were usually circular or rectangular in form occasionally of shaped or scalloped outline some trays were supported upon low feet others had pierced or fretwork galleries or edges to prevent the utensils from slipping off wood or metal was the usual material although ceramic trays were also used at large gatherings a tray was often employed for passing refreshments a servant brings in on a silver tray the cups the sugar bowl the cream jugs pats of butter and smoked meat which are offered to each individual explained ferdinand bayard the principal use of the tray was of course to bring the tea equipage to the table whether placed on a bare or covered table it arrived with the various pieces such as cups and saucers spoons containers for sugar and cream or milk tongs bowls and dishes arranged about the teapot such tea furnishings of ceramic were sold in sets that is all pieces being of the same pattern 
Newspaper advertisements in the 1730s specifically mention tea sets, and later in the century ceramic imports continue to include beautiful complete tea sets. In the early 18th century, tea sets of silver were uncommon, if not actually unique, though pieces were occasionally made to match existing items, and in this way a so-called set, similar to the pieces seen in Tea Party in the time of George I, could be formed. However, by the latter part of the century, the wealthier hostesses were able to purchase from among a most elegant assortment of silver plate complete tea and coffee services, plain and rich engraved. When of metal, tea sets usually consisted of a teapot, containers for sugar and cream or milk, and possibly a slop bowl, while ceramic sets, such as the one seen in family group, included cups and saucers as well. While the tea set illustrated in family group appears to have all the basic pieces, it can hardly be considered a complete tea set when compared with the following porcelain sets listed in the 1747 inventory of James Pemberton of Boston. One set, burnt china, containing twelve cups and saucers, slop bowl, teapot, milk pot, boat for spoons, tea canister, sugar dish, five handle cups, plate for the teapot, and a white tea pot, value twenty pounds. One set, blue and white do, containing twelve cups and saucers, slop bowl, two plates, sugar dish, teapot, six handle cups, and white teapot, value ten pounds. In addition, the Pemberton inventory lists a silver teapot and one pair tea tongs and strainer items that were undoubtedly used with the ceramic sets. Tea sets were even available for the youngest hostess, and the several complete tea table sets of children's cream-colored ceramic toys, mentioned in a Boston advertisement of 1771, no doubt added a note of luxury to make-believe tea parties during playtime. The pieces in children's tea sets, such as the ones pictured from a child set of Chinese export porcelain, usually were like those of regular sets, and differed only in size. Little Miss Livingston must have been happy indeed when her uncle wrote that he had sent a complete tea apparatus for her baby doll. Her doll may now invite her cousin's doll to tea and parade her tea table in form this must be no small gratification to her it would be fortunate if happiness were always attainable with equal ease the pieces of tea equipage could be purchased individually for instance teacups and saucers which are differentiated in advertisements from both coffee and chocolate cups regularly appear in lists of ceramic wares offered for sale such as very handsome sets of blue and white china teacups and saucers or enameled penciled and gilt red and white blue and white enameled and scalloped teacups and saucers these adjectives used by eighteenth-century salesmen usually referred to the types and colors of the decorations that were painted on the pieces enameled most likely meant that the decorations were painted over the glaze and penciled may have implied motifs painted with a fine black line of pencil-like appearance while gilt red and white and blue and white were the colors and type of the decoration blue and white china was perhaps the most popular type of teaware for it regularly appears in newspaper advertisements and inventories and among shards from colonial sites concerning tea the abbe robin went so far as to say that there is not a single person to be found who does not drink it out of china cups and saucers however exaggerated the statement may be it does reflect the popularity and availability of chinese export porcelain in the post-revolutionary period when americans were at last free to engage in direct trade with the orient porcelain for the american market was made in a wide variety of forms as well as in complete dinner and tea sets and was often decorated to special order hand-painted monograms insignia of various kinds and patriotic motifs were especially popular a tea set decorated in this way was sent to dr david townsend of boston a member of the society of the cincinnati by a fellow member of the society major samuel shaw american consul at canton 
in a letter to townsend from canton china dated december twenty seventeen ninety shaw wrote accept my dear friend as a mark of my esteem and affection a tea-set of porcelain ornamented with the cincinnati and your cipher i hope shortly after its arrival to be with you and in company with your amiable partner see whether a little good tea improves or loses any part of its flavour in passing from one hemisphere to the other appended to the letter was the following inventory which provides us with a list of the pieces deemed essential for a fashionable set tea table two teapots and stands sugar bowl and dough milk ewer bowl and dish six breakfast cups and saucers twelve afternoon dew porcelain however had long been a part of china trade cargoes to europe and from there to america the early shipments of tea had included such appropriate vessels for the storage brewing and drinking of the herb as tea jars teapots and tea cups the latter were small porcelain bowls without handles a form which the europeans and americans adopted and continued to use throughout the eighteenth century for tea in contrast to the deeper and somewhat narrower cups usually with handles in which chocolate and coffee were served even after europeans learned to manufacture porcelain early in the eighteenth century the ware continued to be imported from china in large quantities and was called by english-speaking people china from its country of origin porcelain also was referred to as india china ware after the english and continental east india companies the original traders and importers of the ware burnt china was another term used in the eighteenth century to differentiate porcelain from pottery whatever the ware the teacups and saucers whether on a tray the cloth or a bare table were usually arranged in an orderly manner about the teapot generally in rows on a rectangular table or tray and in a circle on a round table or tray in the english conversation piece painting titled mr and mrs hill in their drawing-room by arthur devis about seventeen fifty the circular tripod tea-table between the couple and in front of the fireplace is set in such a way the handleless teacups on saucers are neatly arranged in a large semicircle around the rotund teapot in the centre that is flanked on one side by a bowl and on the other by a jug for milk or cream and a sugar container generally cups and saucers were not piled one upon the other but spread out on the table or tray where they were filled with tea and then passed to each guest End of part two. part three of tea drinking in eighteenth century america by rodris roth this librivox recording is in the public domain pictures show male and female guests holding both cup and saucer or just the cup an english satirical print the old maid published in seventeen seventy seven was the only illustration found that depicted an individual using a dish for tea or to be exact a saucer in the eighteenth century a dish of tea was in reality a cup of tea for the word dish meant a cup or vessel used for drinking as well as a utensil to hold food at meals a play on this word is evident in the following exchange reported by philip fithian between himself and mrs carter the mistress of nominee hall one october forenoon in seventeen seventy three shall i help you mr fithian to a dish of coffee i choose a deep plate if you please ma'am and milk the above suggests that the practice of saucer sipping while it may have been common among the general public was frowned upon by polite society the fact that americans preferred and were accustomed to eating everything hot further explains why tea generally was drunk from the cup instead of the saucer according to peter calm when the english women that is of english descent drank tea they never poured it out of the cup into the saucer to cool it but drank it as hot as it came from the teapot later in the century another naturalist c f volney also noted that very hot tea was beloved by americans of english descent from this it would appear that dish of tea was an expression rather than a way of drinking tea in the eighteenth century 
On the table a saucer seems always to have been placed under the cup, whether the cup was right side up or upside down. Teaspoons, when in use, might be placed on the saucer or left in the cups. The portrait titled Mrs. Combs, painted by G. Freymeyer in 1806, indicates that handling a cup with the spoon in it could be accomplished with a certain amount of grace. Teaspoons also were placed in a pile on the table, or in a silver boat for teaspoons, or, more often, in such ceramic containers as Delfware spoon trays, or blue and white or stenciled china spoon boats. Tongs were especially suited for lifting the lumps of sugar from their container to the teacup. During the 18th century, both arched and scissor-type tongs were used. Instead of points, the latter had dainty flat grips for holding a lump of sugar. The early arched tongs were round in section, as are the pair illustrated in Tea Party in the time of George I, while tongs made by arching or bending double a flat strip of silver date from the second half of the 18th century. These articles of tea equipage variously known as tongs, tea tongs, silver tea tongs, and sugar tongs, were usually made of silver, though ivory and wooden tea tongs were advertised in 1763. According to the prints and paintings of the period, tongs were placed in or near the sugar container. Teaspoons were also used for sugar, as illustrated in the painting Susanna Truax, Perhaps young Miss Truax is about to indulge in a custom favored by the Dutch population of Albany, as reported by Peter Kalm in 1749. They never put sugar into the cup, but take a small bit of it into their mouth while they drink. Shallow dishes, such as the one seen in the portrait Susanna Truax, and hemispherical bowls, were used as containers for sugar often called sugar dishes or just sugars, they were available in delftware, glass, and silver, as well as in blue and white, burnt, enameled, and penciled china. Some containers were sold with covers, and it has been suggested that the saucer-shaped cover of the hemispherical sugar bowl or dish, fashionable in the first half of the 18th century, also served as a spoon tray. However, in the painting, Tea Party at the time of George I, the cover is leaning against the bowl and the spoons are in an oval spoon tray or boat. Another possibility, if the lid was multipurpose, is that it was used as a dish or stand under the teapot to protect the tabletop. Silver sugar boxes, basins, and plated sugar baskets were other forms used to hold sugar, which, in whatever container, was a commodity important to the Americans. As Moreau de Saint-Marie noted, they use great quantities in their tea. Containers for cream or milk may be seen in many of the 18th century tea-time pictures, and are found in the advertisements of the period under a variety of names. There were cream pots of glass and pewter and silver, jugs of penciled and burnt china, and in the 1770s one could obtain enameled and plain three-footed cream jugs from Mr. Henry William Steagall's glass factory at Mannheim, Pennsylvania. There were cream pails, urns, and ewers of silver plate, and plated cream basins gilt inside. Milk pots, used on some tea tables instead of cream containers, were available in silver, pewter, ceramic, and sprigged cut and molded glass. Although contemporary diarists and observers of American customs seem not to have noticed whether cream was served cold and milk hot, or if tea drinkers were given a choice between cream and milk, the Prince de Broglie's comment already cited concerning his ability to drink excellent tea with even better cream and the predominance of cream over milk containers in eighteenth-century advertisements would seem to indicate that in this country cream rather than milk was served with tea in the afternoon while the americans as the europeans added cream or milk and sugar to their tea the use of lemon with the beverage is questionable nowhere is there any indication that the citrus fruit was served or used with tea in eighteenth-century america punch seems to have been the drink with which lemons were associated 
often a medium-sized bowl usually hemispherical in shape is to be seen on the tea table and it is most likely a slop bowl or basin according to advertisements these bowls and basins were available in silver pewter and ceramic before a teacup was replenished the remaining tea and dregs were emptied into the slop bowl then the cup might be rinsed with hot water and the rinsing water discarded in the bowl the slop basin may also have been the receptacle for the moat or foreign particles then inherent in tea but now extracted by mechanical means that had to be skimmed off the beverage in the cup in england this was probably done with a small utensil known to present-day collectors as a moat spoon or moat skimmer although the exact purpose of these spoons remains unsettled it seems likely that they were used with tea it has been suggested that the perforated bowl of the spoon was used for skimming foreign particles off the tea in the cup and the tapering spike-like stem to clear the clogged up strainer of the teapot spout the almost complete absence of american-made moat spoons suggests that these particular utensils were seldom used here possibly the skimmer advertised in seventeen twenty seven with other silver tea pieces was such a spoon no doubt tea strainers were also used to ensure clear tea the tea dregs might then be discarded in the slop bowl or left in the strainer and the strainer rested on the bowl however only a few contemporary american advertisements and inventories have been found which mention tea strainers punch strainers though generally larger in size seem to have doubled as tea strainers in some households the seventeen fifty seven inventory of charles brockwell of boston includes a punch strainer which is listed not with the wine glasses and other pieces associated with punch but with the tea items one small dough a china milk pot one teapot six cups and three saucers and one punch strainer presumably the strainer had just been used for tea the teapot was of course the very centre of the social custom of drinking tea so it usually was found in the centre of the tray or table at first only teapots of oriental origin imported with the cargoes of tea were available for the teapot had been unknown to europeans before the introduction of the beverage however as tea gained acceptance as a social drink and the demand for equipage increased local craftsmen were stimulated to produce wares that could compete with the chinese imports teapots based on chinese models and often decorated with chinese motifs were fashioned in ceramic and silver no doubt many an eighteenth-century hostess desired a silver teapot to grace her table and add an elegant air to the tea ceremony a lottery offering one must have raised many a hope especially if as an advertisement of seventeen twenty seven announced the highest prize consists of an eight square teapot as well as six teaspoons skimmer and tongs by the end of the century an elegant silver teapot with ornamental lid resembling a pineapple would have been the wish of a fashion-conscious hostess less expensive than silver but just as stylish according to the merchant's advertisements were newest fashion teapots of pewter or in the late eighteenth century britannia metal teapots the latest mode in ceramic ware also was to be found upon the tea-table in the mid-eighteenth century it was english brown china teapots of sorts with a raised flower probably the ceramic with a deep rich brown glaze known today as jackfield type ware black green and tortoise a pottery glazed with variegated colors in imitation of tortoise shell and enameled stone teapots at the time of the american revolution tea ware imports included egyptian etruscan embossed red china agate green black cauliflower white and blue and white stone enameled striped fluted pierced and plain queen's ware teapots sometimes the teapot whether ceramic pewter or silver was placed upon a dish or small tile-like stand with feet these teapot stands served as insulation by protecting the surface of the table or tray from the damaging heat of the teapot 
Stands often were included in tea sets, but also were sold individually, such as the penciled china teapot stands advertised in 1775, and the teapot stands of best London plated ware imported in 1797. The stands must have been especially useful when silver equipage was set on a bare table top. Many of the silver teapots of elliptical shape with a flat base, so popular in the latter part of the 18th century, had matching stands raised on short legs to protect the table from the expanse of hot metal. On occasion, the teapot was placed on a spirit lamp or burner to keep the beverage warm. In most instances, it was the hot water kettle that sat upon a spirit lamp or burner rather than a teapot. Kettles were usually related to the form of contemporary teapots, but differed in having a swing handle on top and a large, rather flat base that could be placed over the flame. Advertisements mention tea kettles of copper, pewter, brass, and silver, some with lamps and stands. The actual making of tea was part of the ceremony and was usually done by the hostess at the tea table. This necessitated a ready supply of boiling water close at hand to properly infuse the tea, and, as Ferdinand Bayard reported, it also weakens the tea or serves to clean up the cups. Thus the kettle and burner on their own individual table or stand were placed within easy reach of the tea table. According to 18th century pictures, the kettle was an important part of the tea setting, but it seldom appeared on the tea table. Special stands for kettles generally were made in the same form as the tea tables, though smaller in scale. The square stands often had a slide on which to place the teapot when the hot water was poured into it. Both pictures and advertisements reveal that by the 1770s the tea urn was a new form appearing at tea time in place of the hot water kettle. Contrary to its name, the tea urn seldom held tea. These large silver or silver-plated vessels, some of which looked like vases with domed covers, usually had two handles on the shoulders and a spout with a tap in the front near the bottom. Pontypool, Japaned, Crimson, and gold-striped Roman tea urns, imported from Europe, were among the fashionable tea wares advertised at the end of the 18th century. The urn might be placed on a stand of its own near the table or on the tray or table in the midst of the other equipage, as it is in the painting titled The Honeymoon. Wherever placed, it signified the newest mode in tea-time furnishings. One Baltimorean, O. H. Williams, in a letter dated April 12, 1786, to a close friend, enthusiastically explained that tea and coffee urns plated, mine are partially plated and are extremely neat, are the genteelest things of the sort used now at any house and tables inferior to the first fortunes. The tea canister, a storage container for the dry tea leaves, was yet another piece of equipment to be found on the table or tray. Ceramic canisters of blue and white and red and gold could be purchased to match other tea furnishings of the same ware, and silver tea canisters often were fashioned to harmonize with the silver teapots of the period. Individual canisters were produced, as well as canisters in sets of two or three. A set of canisters usually was kept in the box in which it came, a case known as a tea chest or tea caddy, such as the elegant assortment of tea caddies with one, two, and three canisters, advertised in 1796. Canister tops, if dome-shaped, were used to measure out the tea and transfer it to the teapot. Otherwise, small, short-handled spoons with broad, shallow bowls known as caddy spoons and caddy labels were used. However handled, the tea could have been any one of the numerous kinds available in the 18th century. Although Hyson, Suhong, and Congo, the names inscribed on the canister in figure 22, may have been favored, there were many other types of tea, as the following advertisement from the Boston Newsletter of September 16, 1736, indicates. To be sold, at the three sugar loaves and canister, very choice teas, 
viz bohea tea from twenty two shillings to twenty eight shillings per pound conju tea thirty four shillings pico tea fifty shillings per pound green tea from twenty shillings to thirty shillings per pound fine imperial tea from forty shillings to sixty shillings per pound in the eighteenth century tea drinking was an established social custom with a recognized etiquette and distinctive equipage as we know from the pictures and writings of the period at tea-time men and women gathered to pursue leisurely conversations and enjoy the sociability of the home a study of an english family at tea will summarize the etiquette and equipage of the ritual on the floor near the table is a caddy with the top open showing one canister of a pear the mistress of the house seated at the tea-table is measuring out dry tea-leaves from the other canisters into its lid members of the family stand or sit around the square tea-table while they observe this first step in the ceremony a maid-servant stands ready with a hot water kettle to pour the boiling water over the leaves once they are in the teapot in the background is the tripod kettle stand with a lamp where the kettle will be placed until needed to rinse the cups or dilute the tea not seen in this detail of the painting is the entry of a male servant who is carrying a tall silver pot which may have contained chocolate or coffee these two other social beverages of the eighteenth century were served in cups of a deep cylindrical shape like the three seen on the end of the table the shallow bowl-shaped handleless teacups and the saucers are arranged in a neat row along one side of the table the teapot rests on a square tile-like stand or dish that protects the table from the heat nearby is a bowl to receive tea dregs a pot for cream or milk and a sugar bowl the tea-time ritual has begun end of part three End of Tea Drinking in the 18th Century by Rodris Roth